Thanks, Gregor. Afternoon, Paul. Uh, what can you tell us about the lineup and what went into the final decisions on the players on the periphery? Uh, mostly health on on these guys. Peon comes back in. Uh, he'll play tonight. And then we just got some nicks and bruises uh, that we want to see if we can heal up with the other guys. Helly's playing tonight. Um, Tononato's going in. And um, Parkins and Hainola will come out. We'll go next to Paul Friesen from the Winnipeg Sun. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, Paul. Uh, reading a piece about Paul Stasny this morning, there was a little reflection from Ken Hitchcock how um, – Paul was almost like another coach at times. In fact, he actually came up with a penalty kill uh, solution at one point. Uh, have you had that experience with him as well here, or has he backed off on the coaching? Yeah, he uh, he's a phenomenal resource because he can articulate the game and he can recall plays. And because, you know, at number 1,000, you've seen an awful lot of things in the league, different systems that were run, different plays that were run. Um, so he's great. He's great to talk to. What he's got is a real good kind of general feel of of what's going on, aside from sp the specific plays. Um, so yeah, th those guys you get to right. How's it going? What are you thinking? How's the power play? You know. So he's he's just he's just got so much experience. But there's lots of players with lots of experience, and they don't they don't capture it the same way. I I felt that Paul Stastny was as close to Ron Francis, I think, as any player I've coached. And that's what Ronnie's incredible strength was. He could, as a player, you know, articulate the game uh, from a coach's point of view. And they, and they played it the same way. So neither guy, you know, not blinding speed, but because of their reads on the ice, they got to the right spots. They're very responsible defensively. And then those great kind of small area ha hands. So... There's not a lot of guys that, that are really good offensive players that are really good defensive players as well. And I think it might even be, there may be fewer and fewer of those guys. As you know, these some of these guys now coming in are, are almost pure offensive guys and they haven't spent time valuing kind of the other side of the puck. Paul's a throwback in, in his style of play. We'll go next to Sarah Orleski from TSN. Go ahead, Sarah. Morning, Paul. With the struggles that the team has had recently, is there any concern on your part about the confidence of your group going into these final two games? We're tight with the sticks for sure around the net. I mean, we got a whole bunch of chances last night that you might not think twice about. You'd, you'd, have, you'd have bet your house that we'd have put it into the back of the net. But if you're scoring easy right now, that's going to change, right? You're going to get a week from now and you're not scoring easy this whole thing gets ground and so we got some plays around the net we didn't quite get a stick on there's a real good clip of a rebound that Kyle's got kind of a wide open door and their guy that's their guy gets a stick on it it kills that play so what you want to make sure is that you kind of that frustration is going to change it's going to be the way the game's played so us kind of getting into this getting that idea out of our heads that the offense is going to be easy in a week you know, if you're scoring four and five a night, you feel pretty good about your offensive game, except for that offensive game is not going to be there in a week. And we'll go to Sarah for a follow-up. Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, is it is it a fine line, though, um, I guess, with getting that game right, but then maybe getting some of that good feeling in? We always hear players talk about, you know, whether it be turning on a switch or the challenges maybe of turning yeah, on a switch. Yeah, it's a fine line. You know what I think? I think when a guy scores a regular season goal, he kind of keeps that for himself. Right, he has a little party for himself in the car on the way home. The guy scores a playoff goal, he shares it with everybody, right? Everybody shares in the goal, everybody on the bench. So you can have a guy score a goal and four other guys get confidence from it, right? It just spreads through your team. So I, the, I mean, the, the key for us will be, and we, and we started to do it last night, um, getting the pucks to those hard areas at a high enough volume that you, you eventually get the breaks that you're not getting right now because our volume it hasn't been high enough. And then every once in a while, you'll get a Calgary game. And it was a little bit like what Van did, where Calgary made a few mistakes and you get two breakaways and a couple of two-on-ones in the back of the net. But the rest of the game doesn't look like that. So getting, uh, I mean, comfortable is not word. Get, getting into uh, the mindset of, how, of scoring goals a hard way uh, can be a real, there can be a real payoff for us in this right now. We'll go next to Mike McIntyre from the Winnipeg Free Press. Go ahead, Mike. 
Afternoon, Paul. Just on uh, on Toninato, um, I assume he's been a very good soldier here, signs with you guys, and then, of course, uh, not ready at a camp. And he's only played three games all year, all with yep. the Moose, and had the three goals. Is this just a, a matter of wanting to kind of get a look at him uh, yeah. and, and see what you have? Never, ever crossed my mind that we wouldn't have seen him play a whole lot of games by now. We just stayed really healthy at the start of the year, and then he had an injury there he, he went down to play with the idea that he'd come back and we'd get him in a game and he got injured a little bit so it set him back it's not a carrot for him it's um it's an opportunity for him right that he didn't get early in the year because of our health and because he got set back at the start as you mentioned so this is an important game for him we want to take a look at what he looks like with those two guys with thompson and lewis and we'll go back to mike for a follow-up go ahead mike and then just to check um, on Neil Pionk, are you going to put him back with Josh Morrissey and leave no. DeMello and Forbert together? No, I'm going to put him back with Forbert and I'm going to put DeMello and Morrissey together. We can go to Pionk and Morrissey. And there, it, it, it makes some sense maybe if you're chasing the game a bit and, and you got to get in behind, get a couple of offensive guys in behind. But we won an awful lot of games with Pionk and Forbert doing a real important job for us. And we need to get those guys back to that. We'll go next to Murat Atesh from The Athletic. Go ahead, Murat. Thanks, Gregor. Hi, Paul. Uh, going back to Paul Stastny for a moment, uh, Jamie Compton tells a really nice story of meeting you in the tunnel after a game. Actually, I think it was against St. Louis or before that game, part of me, where you're asking, hey, you know, what about the possibility that we might be able to get this guy? And, and you know, he reflects on the quality of person, says, of course, get him. Do you remember that conversation the same way? And, and how does the, the man live up to, to the, the loving hype that came with him? Yeah, I mean, I, it must have been a road trip that went Dallas to St. Louis because the first conversation was with Kevin. And it was walking from the lobby out to the bus before a game in Dallas. And he said, I got a call today and Paul Stass and he might be available. And uh, I don't know if it was disbelief first because you just don't get those guys right you, you don't get that kind of phone call so then you're doing other than yes yes in the next five minutes please um you do your due diligence and you ask the people that are connected to and boy that one didn't take very long you know, there's four or five people that had crossed paths with them or knew them well and they were just exact it was the exact same conversation over and over again you know really smart hockey player great player uh he's a you know the funny one was always, he's a better player than you think he is and i thought that's funny because i think he's a really good player and then i understand what they're talking about it because i think what they said he's he's a complete player you know it's not just points here this guy's like he does it all he'll kill penalty in his prime he killed penalties as well and did a good job with it and he can do that job he can play against the other team's best. He's smart enough to do that. He's going to create. He makes a lot of little small, small area plays with his hands. So he is exactly what people said he would be, and, and they're probably right. I mean, and by the end of it, I, I, th I don't know that I would say he's a better player than I thought he was. I had a very high opinion of him, but he's certainly a, a, an exceptionally well-rounded player. We'll go next to Jeff Hamilton from the Free Press. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, Paul, I'm, I'm trying to look at some of the positives from, from this stretch for you guys. And, and I'm kind of curious when, you know, when you lose nine out of 10, when it, when it kind of shifts from being less about systems, less about fixing one or two things, and when it just kind of strictly gets personal. And I'm not trying to take, you know, challenge the character integrity of the team, but at what point does it get where you lose so much that it becomes a personal look inside of everybody and that just leads to wins? Or is that something that is dangerous to do? when you're doing, when you're playing such a complex game? No, I, I think that's a, an understandable question from an outside position. Um, and if you took this block of time and you put it in a November scenario, I would understand that. Where's the fight? Like, why, why aren't things going? But we took a completely different approach to it in that after, you know, three or four, after the 6-1 game, it was, this isn't about emotions. It's about the style of hockey that we're playing. And the emotional part of it, I'm not worried about it being there. The style of hockey that I'm playing is, is been, I mean, it's always been a bit of a fight. And, and part of it isn't just the Winnipeg Jets. It's the way the game changes. So now we know going into the playoffs is going to look like this. And we got to get these three things right. And, and in that, at times, you got to take a step back to do it. So we have lost a chunk of our offensive game 
in trying to fix a bunch of these things and, and we need to get it right. Um, we, we know what our lineup for the most part is going to look like. We'll go, we know what we're good at. We know where our weaknesses are. And we have been able to get kind of away with them in some ways because it's regular season hockey and you can get away with that. But if your idea is coming out of this stretch and not just getting it fixed, I have no interest in getting it fixed. I have a whole lot of interest in getting me way better at two or three things. And we're going to play two of the most offensive teams in the NHL, right? They've got the two freak shows and, and, and I mean that respectively, the incredibly gifted players that can win a series on their own. And then Toronto's got four or five exceptionally gifted players. So there's a style of game that we have to be able to handle or we're not going to beat them. I don't think our regular season play would have allowed us. It lets you beat them in the regular season because they're loose too. So we're trying to get to another place. So at never point did I, was this a, a character issue? Hey, fellas, go back and play the game. You know, if you had any character, you'd play the game you played two months ago. We played some really good, gritty, for sure, regular season hockey, but it's going to look different in a week and a half. And we've got to make that adjustment, that changeover to play that kind of game. We'll go next to Kelly Moore from 680 CGOB. Go ahead, Kelly. Hey, good afternoon, Paul. Always fascinated with uh, coaching decisions uh, either before or during a game. So, yeah, last night, about halfway through the game, I think it was right after Nate Thompson had that great scoring opportunity. Vancouver iced the puck, but you kept your fourth line out there. Uh, in some circles, that would be unconventional, but I'm guessing there was some rational decision making that went behind that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not chasing the win at that point. You look at the numbers by the end of the game, I knew we were going to get to that, that I would push Scheisslein real hard later in the game. And there was a shift before I didn't particularly love, so I'm not throwing somebody out in that. And I like what, what Nate Thompson and those guys did. Um, so I'm not running the bench exactly as I would run it in a playoff game right now at all. The, the minutes are different because I wanted to push those guys like they there's a conditioning part of that too. So I wanted to push them hard tonight. I'm going to run a pretty flat bench here tonight. I'm going to keep the minutes right down for, for everybody if I can. And I'll tell them that before the game so that they know what to expect going in. So you don't always, you don't run the same bench in my mind every game. And I wanted those guys. I hadn't played them a whole hell of a lot early on trying to get a feel for where the power plays and the penalty killing are going. We got into a better power play at the end of the first and uh, yeah, for sure, I'll put an offensive line on a, on an icing that I think is a, enough time on the clock. So if you're going to do a short icing, your line's out there, they got 15, 20 seconds, they short ice it. Uh, putting another line out there just changes your matchup, doesn't give you an advantage. You get a, t a line that's been out there for a minute and a half, you're changing that line all day long for sure. And final question to Scott Billick from The Sun. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks, Greg. Good afternoon, Paul. Uh, you talked a little bit about outsider perspective, and I guess, you know, from my vantage point, you know, just watching Derek Forbert's play of late, it, it, I don't know if he's hobbled or dealing with something or, or just maybe, you know, a, a little tired at this point. I mean, would you agree or is he just trying to work through something or, or what's going on there? I think he's if played anything? like, I think he's played like our team. You know, I, I don't think I, I, I get you, you, I got a list. Right. There are other players on it that, that are under their performance level right now, for sure. Um, but at the end of the day, for us to win, we're going to need him to play his best hockey. So we're going to put him back with Neil. And we're going to try to get that out of him here tonight. 